quite a large number of people have joined us now. So uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to St. Philip's Chambers webinar, taking the A out of ADR. Uh, I'm Tony Verdon, uh, an ADR group accredited mediator and specialist in real estate disputes. Uh, and our speakers today are Naomi Candlin, a CMC accredited mediator, trained by the London School of Mediation in 2018, uh, a member of Hunt ADR panel, uh, an associate of Midlands Mediators, as well as a deputy district judge experienced in conducting uh, FDRs. And we have Jonathan Gale, also very experienced in mediation uh, and now trained by Phoenix Dispute Solutions Services uh, to conduct them uh, and an International Mediation Institute uh, member. Uh, as I said, for those who have just joined, and I can see that there's quite a number just joining now, we have the chat screen, uh, chat stream, I should say, uh, open. Uh, if anyone has any questions, we invite you to uh, put them on there and then we'll uh, look at those. Uh, at the end of the seminar. Uh, our discussion today is inspired by the Civil Justice Council's report uh, of June 2021 uh, supporting uh, compulsory ADR. Uh, that report challenged the position of Lord Dyson in uh, Halsey and Milton Keynes from 2004, uh, and its authors consider that ADR can lawfully be compelled, uh, and uh, it sets out uh, a number of reasons uh, why the authors consider that to be uh, desirable. So, uh, Naomi, uh, why make uh, mediation uh, mandatory? Well, thanks very much for your introductions, Tony. Mediation has already become a very popular means of resolving disputes. Only a tiny fraction of cases, around 3%, go all the way to trial. And of the 90% that don't, many would have resolved at mediation or one or other of the forms of ADR, such as early neutral evaluation or a financial dispute resolution hearing. Of those which do make mediation, around 85% settle on the day of mediation or shortly thereafter. The reason the success rate is so high is that parties like the process. It's civilised, it's flexible, it keeps the parties in control, it's private, it leads to mutually satisfactory or win-win outcomes. It permits parties to walk away from the dispute with dignity. And above all, if undertaken at the right moment in the litigation, can make enormous savings in time and expense. The court process, by contrast, tends to lead to a binary outcome, win-lose, which in the worst cases can wreck people's lives and livelihoods. Whilst it's still common to hear clients say that they want their day in court, in reality, with witnesses, witness statements taken as read, they rarely have the opportunity to feel really heard in court. Court ends up being time consuming, expensive, stressful, and often for clients, distressing. The ambiance of mediation, by contrast, is much calmer, and with online mediation can even be conducted from the comfort of your own home. It's a much more measured way to resolve disputes, especially ones involving family members or work colleagues, but also ones where corporate reputations are at stake. Another advantage is that an agreement that all sides have reached has more mutual buy-in than a court-based solution, and in consequence, there tend to be far fewer issues of enforcement. At a time when courts are struggling with an ever greater backlog of cases, the less recourse clients need to the court to reach and then implement a settlement, the better. Why, with all these advantages, should mediation not be made entirely mainstream and indeed mandatory? It wouldn't, of course, be mandatory to settle, but mandatory to mediate as a step in the litigation process. It would completely normalise mediation. It would prevent there being any concern on either side that agreeing to mediate might indicate a weakness in their case. It would oblige clients who weren't yet aware of the advantage of mediation to try it and see. It would also provide an excuse if needed for those solicitors who remain less familiar with the process to experience its benefits themselves. And it would also ride the wave of the current trend towards ever greater emphasis on mediation, as shown by its growing importance within legal professional training programmes. With all these advantages, it really is time to concur with Sir Geoffrey Voss, Master of the Roles, who in his speech at the relaunch of Hull University's Mediation Centre in March 2021 said, why do we keep on talking about alternative dispute resolution? There is nothing alternative about either mediation, early neutral evaluation or judge-led resolution. 
what I hope to achieve is to take out the alternative from ADR. Thank you. So, Jonathan, if uh, Sir Geoffrey Voss were with you uh, at, say, uh, a Christmas party, or should I say a business lunch, uh, what would be some uh, of the objections to his proposals? Thank you, Tony. Uh, mediation is so obviously a good thing, as Naomi has so clearly and succinctly outlined, that advertising and information ought to be sufficient, and there is no need for compulsion. Mediation is already becoming mainstream. The Center for Effective Dispute Resolution, or CEDA, report of 2020 put the number of mediations in England and Wales up by 38% from its last report in 2018. It put the success rate at 93% um, in terms of those that settle. Now, different organizations give different estimates, but voluntary mediation with its relaxed character is successful. So why risk it by changing the character of mediation with compulsion? Delay and expense and the court backlog are concerns to which mandatory mediation, taking cases out of litigation, are an attractive answer. But there are objections in practice and in principle. I'll deal with the objections in practice first. The first one may be described as killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. The high success rate, by which is meant a settlement rate at or shortly after mediation, when wholly voluntary, people want to be there. It's unlikely that such a high settlement rate would subsist if mediation were compulsory and people were there because they had to be. Secondly, there's the impossibility. It's actually impossible to force people to mediate. What we're actually talking about is attendance at some form of mediation. But you can't force people to engage any more than you can force people to enjoy a film. There's no real answer to the problem of perfunctory performance. Thirdly, the cost. Now, it's true, early settlement saves money, but mediation without settlement is an added expense, which may be disproportionate in itself. Mandatory mediation may generate a captive market, which might tend to drive prices up unless we have some form of publicly funded mediation, as they have in Italy, a sort of NHS for mediation, or perhaps we should call it Mediaid, which might not be a bad idea, but it doesn't seem very likely. If mediation becomes mainstream, what is stopping parties spending huge amounts of money on legal teams and psychologists, of course, psychology plays a huge role in negotiation and mediation. There might be an arms race in gaming mediation. I've heard mediation described by a, um, one of my pupil supervisors, in fact, I won't, uh, I won't give the name, um, as another way to bash the other side. With all the advantages of mediation, mandatory mediation is a further barrier to access to justice. Now, besides the three that I've outlined, there are other practical problems. Where will all the mediators come from? To qualify as a mediator, one takes a five-day course, a written assignment and a practical exam. Is that enough? A bad mediation will simply fail and it'll be an added expense. Uh, there might be an unethical mediation where a party has been coerced to give up its rights inappropriately and unjustly. Then there are also unintended counterproductive consequences. Currently, unreasonable refusal to attend mediation can be sanctioned in costs which is a powerful incentive to agree to mediation. Those parties, if forced to attend a mediation, would have no incentive once there to engage in mediation. So in fact, we would lose the current cost sanction that we have, everybody had as a matter of course to attend a mediation. Secondly, mandatory mediation might actually increase the number of speculative claims. If claimants know that a defendant will be forced to come to the table to mediate, they might be more inclined to put in a claim to see what they can get. Another unintended consequence, which we, we see a little bit in, in the jurisdiction where they have got mandatory mediation um, in Ontario, um, is that mediation can swamp other possibilities for alternative dispute resolution. Lawyers are unwilling to give ground for mediation, and one can see that that might be the case. One wants to enter mediation with the strongest position one has, and if one's already given ground already, that might weaken the position. So lawyers might actually, it might actually freeze a settlement or 
disincentivize settlement. And of course, after the mediations failed, it's more likely to be full steam ahead to trial. So those are some of the objections in practice, but there is also a principle. There are many ways to resolve a dispute. Fighting. In medieval times, we had trial by ordeal, but for a thousand years, society has settled on justice as a way of resolving disputes. But justice is not the same thing as dispute resolution. Mediation is aimed at expedient result. It might be a good result, but it's not necessarily a just one. In a mediation, more reasonable parties will give ground. Mediators who have no duty to ensure a just result will not discourage them from doing so and will criticize their representatives for posturing if they discourage their clients from giving ground. Parties can profit in a mediation from taking and holding for a long time onto an unreasonable position. And any concession in a mediation can look like a breakthrough. A represented party has an advantage magnified in the mediation where the mediator doesn't express an opinion on the law or may not be legally qualified and may well end up just joining with the professional in beating down the unrepresented party. Commercial might will be right and lawyers ought to have at least an eye on this. Mediation is entirely pointed at settlement and if success rates remain as high in compulsory mediation as say 93% or 85%, depending on which figure you take, then that will be the percentage of cases that will not have a clearly just outcome. This is likely to erode confidence in justice. And there is a wider interest in the public knowing that their disputes will be resolved fairly and not just expediently. Even if it comes with a bit of pill of stress and expense, a day in court is a right, and that ought not to be forgotten. In Halsey, in Milton Keynes Area Health Authority, Dyson, uh, Lord Dyson, uh, Dyson Lord Justice as he there was, held that compelling mediation would be contrary to Article 6 of the European Court of the Human Rights. Sub subsequent EU case law cast doubt on that, and the Civil Justice Council indicated that it thinks limited mandatory mediation, if quick and affordable, may be lawful. The status of the CJC report is open to doubt. Can it overturn precedent in our unwritten constitution? It's an interesting legal question, but we ought in any event to guard the independence of the judiciary. Right. So let's assume the master of the walls is unmoved by uh, your um, commentary. Um, Naomi, what might mandatory mediation uh, look like? Well, at least at the moment, there are essentially two models, judge-led mediation and independent mediation. Both models are already well established. In the county courts, judge-led mediation currently includes early neutral evaluation, which the Court of Appeal case of Lomax decided could be ordered pursuant to the overriding objective, even if both parties didn't consent. In this context, early neutral evaluation involves a judge giving an early evaluation of the respective merits of each side's case to assist parties in reaching a settlement. ENE forms part of financial dispute resolution hearings, which are an automatic part of the process of financial remedy disputes and are typically heard after a first directions appointment. They've also been extended more widely to disputes involving wider family members, such as Inheritance Act claims and neighbour disputes. Again, a judge will typically give a non-binding indication of where the merits lie and thus assist parties to resolve the claim. Obviously, if the case doesn't settle, the judge who hears the ENE or FDR will take no further part in the claim. Since COVID caused such backlogs at the courts, some county courts, including Birmingham, have introduced dispute resolution hearings for small claims. With a few exceptions, such as road traffic accidents where liability is disputed, all small claims are listed for a half hour telephone resolution hearing at which a judge may give a view on the merits of the case and in any event encourage parties to talk, negotiate and settle. There's a high success rate and the model is likely to continue. As to judge-led mediations in the first tier tribunal, I'll leave those to you, Tony, to address later in the webinar. As far as independent mediations are concerned, there's already an element of compulsion in certain arenas, such as private family and employment law. 
In private family matters, many claims cannot be brought until the claimant has attended a so-called MIAM, a mediation, information and assessment meeting, which explores options for resolving the dispute other than through court. In employment law, employees must first consult ACAS before bringing a claim against their employer in the tribunal. Perhaps the types of mediation which most of us are familiar with, however, are civil and commercial mediations, whereby all parties meet, nowadays in a suite of real or virtual rooms, and a suitably qualified independent mediator shuttles between rooms, taking offers and assisting in bringing the parties towards a resolution. Most of these types of mediation are facilitative rather than evaluative, so the mediator doesn't give a view as to the respective merits, but effectively acts as devil's advocate in each room, encouraging parties to reflect on pragmatic solutions, including considering the weaknesses of their case and the costs of going forward in order to facilitate a compromise. Looking into the future, it's very likely that in time, artificial intelligence will be used to facilitate online blind bidding and other tech-based resolutions. These are likely to be highly cost-effective solutions to lower value claims. Thank you. Um, as a member of the uh, International Mediation uh, Institute, Jonathan, uh, is this practice of uh, mandatory mediation something that has been tried extensively elsewhere? Uh, yes, indeed, it has been tried elsewhere. Um, in Italy, Greece and Turkey, there are programmes which have relatively recently started and longer established ones in Ontario and California. And there's one in New York as well. However, in most jurisdictions in the Eastern Hemisphere, it's relatively recent and the results are hard to interpret. Different countries have different starting points. Uh, in Italy, Greece and Turkey, mediation was not well established or trusted and they have a very different judicial system from that which exists here. The mediation story in Italy is quite an interesting one, and I've got uh, this information from a couple of articles which are on the internet. One from uh, about the history of mandatory mediation in, in Italy from ResearchGate called Mandatory Mediation in the Italian Experience by Giovanni Mappeucci, December 2015, and uh, an article about the procedure in current mandatory mediation in Italy from Lexology. Called Mediation Procedure in Italy by Alessandro Bruni, 2019. Italy introduced voluntary regulated man mediation, regulated mediation not mandatory, in 2003. It was largely ignored. The reason given was because it was not compulsory. Italian lawyers were hostile to mediation and judges were not interested. Meanwhile, Italy was well known as the sick man of Europe with over 5 million cases pending in justice terms. The length of time cases took to be disposed of in Italy was a standing joke. Those dealing in international litigation may be familiar with the concept of the Italian torpedo, where a potential defendant could issue a preemptive claim in Italy, effectively torpedoing any litigation on the same subject anywhere else. In response to an EU directive in 2011, Italy introduced mandatory mediation as a precondition for certain cases proceeding to final hearing. The market was flooded by an explosion of poorly trained mediators. Lawyers were dead against it and they boycotted it and the judiciary was not interested and didn't enforce it. It was scrapped in 2012, but it was reintroduced in 2013 in a little bit more measured way with the first introductory mediation session, which has an identical tariff for public and private providers. The mediator is paid by the provider. So effectively it's pu publicly funded, at least in part. The procedure in Italy is much more formal than the mediation we're used to here. There can be witnesses, there can be expert evidence. It's a multi-phase procedure. And importantly, lawyers must attend all phases of a mandatory mediation. According to the Lexology article, Mediation Procedure in Italy, the Bruni, Bruni uh, 2019, for every type of mediation, the law orders a mandatory preliminary meeting in which the mediator explains to the parties the function and how to conduct the mediation. The mediator, in the same first meeting, then invites the parties and their lawyers to discuss the prospects of beginning the mediation process, and if positive, to proceed with the conduct of the mediation. After this point, if the parties reach a positive accord to start the mediation proceeding, two different scenarios are possible. If the parties are able to reach a written agreement, the mediator drafts the minutes of the meeting, and that must be signed by all parties, the mediator and the lawyers. If no agreement is reached at the party's request, 
the mediator must issue a non-binding proposal about resolution of the dispute, which the parties may choose to accept or refuse. If either party refuses the proposal, the mediation is considered to have failed and, in, and any party may commence a lawsuit. But if the judicial decision is identical to the previous mediator's proposal, such decision may affect the allocation of judicial expenses. The court will refuse to award all the costs and the expenses to the winning party if that party has previously rejected the mediator's proposal. In such circumstances, the court will order the winning party to pay the losing party's costs and court fees. So the mediator is not, not quite the independent facilitator that we're used to in, in private mediations here, and perhaps more, more like a, a, a judicial type of mediation. The results, in Italy in 2018, 26% of mandatory mediation settled and 46% of voluntary ones settled. And that's from the, the Bruni report, 2019. There are also results in uh, California and Ontario um, and I got this information from uh, an article at mediate.com uh, by Jennifer Weinstone, also 2015. Um, in California, it's been adopted, mandatory mediation has been adopted for family disputes, uh, particularly involving child custody. And in Ontario, by contrast, it's been adopted for all civil disputes except family disputes. In Ontario, it was adopted to address the cost and delay, um, and early mediation was mandatory in disputes. It's had a modest success rate, 15%. When you think about it, that's not very good because that means that 85% of cases coming to court will incur additional costs of mediation, which has failed. It seems here, as I alluded to before, that it seems lawyers are less, like, less inclined to give ground before mediation and mediation may well have swamped other means of ADR. The Ontario regime excludes family disputes because of concerns over family dynamics and possible power imbalances that can create unfair advantage of one party over the other. California has taken the opposite approach and introduced mandatory mediation for family disputes with the custody of children. They have a much better success rate. There, in California, mediation is very stringent. The mediator is not chosen by the parties and has power to exclude counsel from mediation. So the opposite of Italy as well. The mediator wears the hat of a mediator and a judge, and it's very different from Ontario. Um, and it's also very different from our classical facilitating mediation. The Californian model has been criticized for actively harming women, both by exposing victims of domestic violence to further abuse and by imposing a process in which women may be inherently disadvantaged because of societal prejudices and sociological gender tendencies. Now, that was in 2015. I had a look and I, I can't see that, it's, that the, the, the system has particularly changed uh, since then, but it, it may have done. However, with the risks, come rewards. And in California, half of cases coming to mandatory mediation are fully resolved, and two thirds of the cases are partially resolved through that mediation. Right, thank you. Um, well, perhaps we can move on to look at some of the practical issues which are likely to arise uh, in this jurisdiction. Uh, Naomi, when would mandatory mediation take place? Well, what's been dubbed the sweet spot for when a case is most likely to settle will, of course, vary from case to case. So mandatory mediation could be offered at different times throughout the litigation process, starting as is already encouraged pre-action. There could then be a compulsory stay for mediation upon issue. Obviously, the advantage of mediating as early as possible is that fewer costs have been incurred. Depending on the value and complexity of the case, and hence the number of directions hearings, mediation could be considered as a, as a direction on each occasion. In simpler disputes, mediation can be effective pre-disclosure and pre-witness statements. In more complex cases, exchange of evidence is often necessary before issues can be honed and mediation can be effective. As a final measure, mediation can, of course, also be undertaken just before trial, although costs would have mounted considerably by this time. Nevertheless, it avoids trial fees and refreshers, and if the mediation at that point isn't successful, the preparation is likely to overlap substantially with pre-trial preparation and conferences. Mandatory mediation could become part of the litigation timetable like costs budgeting has become in suitable cases. It would be compulsory, which does have its own associated costs, but it's an opportunity to review the case as a whole and consider the cost consequences and risks of continuing. Like cost budgeting, mediation can act as a reality check on the case. 
with compulsion used uh, uh, abroad, Jonathan, um, what should be the sanctions for failure to mediate? Well, the obvious sanction we have here would be striking out of a statement of case for failure to comply with the rule of order. Um, there are already potential cost sanctions where a party is shown to have refused mediation unreasonably. Um, and, and that's a logical consequence because um, failure to mediate, failure to settle, drives up costs. That's the, pre that's the preliminary um, problem with it. So a cost sanction seems as though it's appropriate. Another approach would be to make attendance at a mediation part of the process. So a claimant would not have standing to make a claim until mediation has been attempted. That's the way they have it similar, uh, similar to that in Italy, rather like the Arbitration Act, only for mediation. And finally, Naomi, what, type of, what types of cases would be best suited, or, or indeed unsuited, uh, to compulsory mediation here? Well, mediation's already been tried and tested and is well suited to disputes between people who may need to continue with a relationship beyond the litigation, such as neighbour and boundary disputes, contentious probate and inheritance act disputes. It's also got a proven track record in resolving commercial claims where parties don't want the expenditure of company time and money or the publicity of litigating the dispute. Cases which may be less suited to mediation include personal injury where liability is in dispute and cases where a party seeks declaratory relief. And cases which are really unsuitable for mediation include family cases involving any allegations of domestic abuse and very high profile cases requiring precedent. Jonathan, do you have any further comments on that? Uh, well, intuitively, one may suppose in terms of cost benefit analysis that cases which may be expensive to litigate but easy to resolve might be best suited for mediation, such as cases with many different issues and no one single overarching issue. It's time consuming to litigate all the issues, but they may be wrapped up in an agreement. Uh, mediation has so many advantages that it can be suited to many different types of case. There are also the less usual non-money claims where the advantages of mediation could be to arrive at a bespoke solution rather than a court injunction, which may be a blunt instrument. The UK Intellectual Property, Property Office provides a very inexpensive mediation service, both online and in person. So far, the uptake has not been tremendous. Uh, a Freedom of Information request in 2018 result, re uh, revealed that there had been only 26 mediations between 2013 and 2018. They had a 70% success rate, but clearly more work is, um, is required in intellectual property cases, at least to encourage parties to mediate. Thank you both. Um, what are the courts likely to make of compulsory alternative dispute resolution? Uh, now, uh, I want to address this briefly. And of course, I can't speak on behalf of the courts and tribunals in my judicial capacity uh, as a recorder uh, and tribunal judge. But I can make some observations. Uh, courts, I think, will be guarded uh, about uh, compulsion, uh, and especially in respect of uh, early mediations. Uh, the figures uh, it would be noticed can vary from uh, source to source, but if more than 90% of cases which come to court settle, and it seems to be well over 90% settle, uh, then it's only economic to uh, compel mediation if some of the remainder that would otherwise fight are going to be mediated to a conclusion. Now, identifying uh, and resolving uh, those early uh, after issue will be very difficult to manage uh, and assess, especially in courts like Birmingham, with high volumes of work and shortage of experienced judicial staff. So I think there are problems there, but the picture in tribunals is rather different. Uh, in the property chamber where I sit, uh, there has recently been uh, refresher training for judges to act as mediators, which is a sign of uh, enthusiasm, I'm sure. Um, land registration uh, may soon be regularly offering uh, mediations for the first time since the initial lockdown, which is of interest because the land registration division is a small tribunal uh, within the property chamber. Uh, negotiation is always encouraged by um, HM land registry, even before the cases get to the tribunal. Uh, but then cases are triage for suitability uh, following the uh, exchange of statements of case and before other expenses are incurred. Uh, residential property division of the property chamber is a much bigger operation, um, full stop. Um, 
but it's also stepping up the services uh, which it is now offering in terms of mediation. Uh, both uh, divisions of the property chamber are modelling their offerings on uh, conventional mediations as we know them, uh, rather than say uh, an FDR. Uh, but in both, uh, they can sometimes feel or have that feel of being an early neutral evaluation. And that's because the mediators are all judges within the tribunal. And although they're not wearing their judicial hats and will say so, and although they won't be later involved in the case, uh, that perhaps gives them uh, greater uh, freedom uh, or scope uh, for uh, looking at the uh, underlying merits as well as the uh, rival uh, positions being adopted by the parties and not so much a devil's advocate uh, as devil's judge. Time management is often stricter, it has to be said, in relation to the tribunals. I think with the uh, residential property usually looking at uh, no longer than three hours for a mediation uh, and land registration would certainly not be expecting uh, mediations to run uh, over the uh, or beyond uh, the usual sitting time uh, of a judge. Now these forms of mediation currently retain a voluntary status and it has to be said that I don't really detect any enthusiasm in senior judicial staff or judiciary uh, for compulsion uh, and I sense that the same is probably true of the uh, senior bar. Supplementing private mediations with a tribunal scheme though does seem to be practicable uh, and helps those without the necessary resources uh, or experience to engage a private mediator. And perhaps this issue of mandatory mediations feeds into a, a broader question. Um, for the courts, particularly, uh, are yet more rules really uh, the way ahead? Uh, there has been something of an overload of interventions, it might be thought, uh, in recent years. It started with cost management, uh, and now, particularly in the business and property courts, uh, disclosure pilots uh, and renewed interest in the uh, minutiae of preparation of witness statements. Each innovation adds uh, work, therefore costs, uh, and potentially uh, can lead to delays. Seems to me that there may be a middle course here uh, with closely directed consideration of ADR at the Cost and Case Management Conference. Uh, for those parties who haven't yet uh, engaged uh, in it. Uh, it seems to me that at the moment, uh, although mediation might crop up as an issue uh, for the timetabling of directions, uh, it is not something which is a particular focus at that stage uh, and that, that might be something uh, which could be uh, focused on uh, and enhanced going forward. Uh, now, to some extent that is speculative, we will just have to see uh, how these things uh, progress over time. Now I can see that we've still uh, we've got a number of uh, participants who are uh, listening in to uh, the uh, discussions and uh, what's been uh, said. This is an opportunity if anybody has uh, any questions uh, to uh, put them uh, on the chat stream uh, for uh, any of the speakers uh, to uh, try to uh, field. So please do feel free uh, if you can uh, do that, that would be uh, much appreciated. Um, I did have one question actually for Naomi, uh, if, uh, if I may. Um, uh, Naomi, you talk about people being heard at mediations in a way that they might not be heard in, um, in cases because of things like uh, written statements. Do, could you just expand upon that a little bit over how you think um, mediations might provide the opportunity for uh, individuals to be heard uh, in that sort of framework? Well, I would say that very often either the, the opening session or particularly with online mediations, what we tend nowadays to do is to have a half hour, 45 minute sort of tech rehearsal the night before. And I find that that's a very opportune moment for people just to sound off. And it, they, they never get that opportunity in court because effectively you give the, you, the witness statement is taken as read, you might have a few um, extra supplementary questions, but then it's straight into hostile cross-examination. And actually many people just want to have their story heard. And that's often an important first part of the mediation before you start being able to move on and get parties to put that behind them and start looking forward towards a resolution. So I think it's actually a forum in which people do feel heard. 
Thank you. Um, we've got a question which has uh, come in and it's, it's in two parts and I think I'm going to feel the first one. Um, have you found there to be a substantial difference between in-person and remote mediations? Uh, and the question continues, and do you have a preference uh, as to which would be better if mediations become compulsory? Uh, the, the, just dealing with my own personal experience of the first one, I've done a number of um, remote uh, mediations, particularly during lockdowns, including several for the uh, Land Registration Division of the First Year Tribunal. And um, my experience was that although the, obviously the mechanics is slightly different, um, that I didn't really detect uh, substantial differences between uh, that and in-person mediations, the opportunity to be heard as we've just discussed, uh, was there. Uh, shuttle diplomacy could be uh, run by uh, setting up uh, uh, meeting rooms that the mediator can go back and forth. Uh, having said that, I'm not sure that was the universal experience because the land registration division then decided that it had a reduced success rate in mediations which were being dealt with remotely uh, and the uh, offering was uh, suspended. I suspect uh, that so there might have been other issues as well about the uh, uh, availability of judicial staff to deal with mediations in that context. But certainly I didn't have uh, experience um, uh, any difference. Um, jo Jonathan, did, uh, do you um, see there being a material difference between success rates and matters of that sort? It's very difficult to tell because I, in my experience, is, um, I, I've not yet conducted any mediations, but my experience as, as an advocate in, in mediation is that all mediations are different. So it's very difficult to compare a mediation which you happen to have done online with one which you happen to have uh, done, done in person. But um, and I've, I've had, there's been successful mediations in both ways. Uh, I would say, in relation to the second part, part of the question, if mediation becomes compulsory, um, the, the concern of the, of the, of the uh, Civil Justice Council is that mediation is uh, cheap and, uh, and quick. Um, and of course, there are advantages for, for economies of, of having um, remote mediations if it becomes compulsory. But on the other hand, you have people who might not actually have the technology to participate in a remote mediation. So that might also act as a barrier to, to mediation and justice as well. Yes. Thank you. Um, the, there's a question on the, uh, the chat line. I was engaged in a successful mediation last Tuesday, well done, uh, which took some time to persuade the parties to mediate. In your opinion, by making it mandatory, do you think that there will be a higher settlement rate or will the parties just be ticking a box? I think that is a concern which, uh, which Jonathan raised, Naomi. Box ticking? Could that really happen? Well, I, I, it's, it, it, it's a challenge. But I don't think it's in it's insuperable. Many people, it's just a matter that they're perhaps not familiar with mediation. They, they've never conducted it before. So in a way, it's just um, just greater awareness of it and um, taking them along and sort of explaining the process. And that's why in, in some respects, an online mediation where people are working from the comfort of their own home um, can be very useful. And I, I don't see any particular reason why um, perfunctory performance should necessarily be a problem, certainly not something which needs to deter uh, greater use of uh, mediation and even it being compulsory in certain circumstances. Um, I, I often find that at the start of a mediation, people say, oh, I, I want my day in court, I don't care how much it costs, but they don't really mean it, you know, give them two or three hours and they're talking, they're talking uh, serious money. So I, I don't think that that is, um, is necessarily an obstacle, no. Jonathan, do you want to come back on that at all? Uh, well, uh, I mean, it, it, it's inevitably there will be people who are just ticking a box. Um, that might also be the case in, in voluntary mediation as well. There are there are people who, who do who attend a mediation just to tick a box when, when, when it's voluntary. Um, I mean, there are there are some some results uh, about success rates. Um, which I, I, I alluded to a couple in, in Italy, the difference between success rates and mediation when it's mandatory and, and when it's voluntary appear uh, intuitively to confirm what, what we suspect, which is that um, the voluntary nature of the mediation parties are there because they want to be there. They've decided they want to, in, by and large, they want to settle this, this case. Um, they, they, um, they will um, are probably more likely to, to settle. So inevitably there'll be, an element of box ticking, I should think. 
And we've got a, a question also, do you have any suggestions or tips about how to avoid progress in a mediation being limited to the very end of a mediation? Um, I'm, I'm going to offer uh, my own view in relation to that. One of the things that I do generally as an introductory in my introductory comments, I, either to the parties in their own rooms or in a plenary session, if you have plenary session, uh, is to um, is to challenge that view straight away and to say that uh, that this isn't going to be a uh, to lay down some ground rules really to say this isn't going to be a war of attrition to see who can who can hang on the, the longest before uh, some movement takes place by very strongly encouraging the parties to get to uh, beyond the exploration stage and into and into an, an offer stage by lunchtime with a view to making serious progress and, and also I think there's a, perhaps a role for uh, the advocates as well as the mediator in encouraging people towards um, early uh, significant uh, movement. I think that quite often parties are hesitant about uh, making any significant early movement and then engage in this kind of cheese pairing exercise in case they go too far. But in fact, there's a real advantage in uh, making or taking uh, an early position, which might involve significant concessions, because it gives you some scope for then saying, well, you're setting the parameters of, of the mediation, you're, you're actually already identifying, this is, comes into what Jonathan said earlier about some of the psychology, but you're, you're, you're proposing and setting out the sort of framework for the sort of settlement which is likely to come forward. Whereas if you engage in very lengthy, just uh, baby steps towards some sort of middle ground, then you're not going to achieve that. And the um, a lot of time can be wasted and it can be unproductive. So that's one technique is definitely to address that as an issue up front. Uh, in judicial mediations, um, quite frankly, when, I, when I'm sitting there as a, as, as a judge um, and being paid my judicial rate, which is a lot smaller than my private rate, I do tell people that and I say, I'm not gonna be here uh, beyond a certain time unless there has been some progress and that also focuses the mind that, if you like, brings the end of the mediation earlier uh, in prospect and gets peak parties uh, moving sooner. So those are some of the techniques I might use. Uh, Naomi, do you have any uh, have anything to uh, to add on the perennial problem of the uh, five to five offer? <laughs> well, I, I'd echo your uh, um, comments, Tony. And I've also found that, again, with the online mediations and doing these half hour or 45 minute pre-meet sessions the evening before, I make sure that I get parties thinking about offers the night before. So if they haven't yet, they're thinking about it overnight. And I prepare them for the fact that really, if this mediation is going to go um, smoothly and is going to be completed, and let's face it, particularly online, it, it can be very, very tiring. So I think generally parties want to be finishing by five or six o'clock. They need to be making offers early. And as I've got more experienced at mediation, I find that I, I make sure that I, I keep the pressure on and that actually I've got offers coming uh, early, early, as early in the morning as I can, because if, if you get to lunchtime parties, frustrated if they suddenly realize the morning is absolutely whizzed by it's 12 o'clock and, and they're still really effectively talking about the past so yes I, I also uh, get try to get parties thinking about offers early and also just again echoing you Tony I, I compare the sort of the salami slicing as it were where they just do a tiny bit by bit or rather you know really just jumping in and actually when you set it out to people they understand that it, it's going to take all day and all night to very very slowly salami slice the the case particularly if it's just a financial matter so it's actually better to be making realistic offers as soon as possible John, jonathan what are the trainers saying in the kind of mediation services where they're you know getting young enthusiastic uh, mediators uh, in to you know to, how, how are the, how are they addressing the, that sort of perennial issue um, well, what what I've been advised is uh, not to take, not to start taking offers too early. Um, in, in fairly fairly strong terms, um, the, uh, an offer too early can derail a mediation, and um, a lot of the groundwork needs to be done to start with by identifying the the interests of the parties uh, rather than the positions that they've adopted, uh, and 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 really get getting into uh, what the parties actually want. Um, that way, uh, you, you avoid this sort of uh, Persian market kind of um, 
but bargaining position where you where you split the difference. Uh, and there, there are quite a few um, texts on negotiation about this. Uh, I think one is called Don't Split the Difference, um, where, where it is actually what, what you're trying to do is identify what the parties actually need and what they want, um, which might not necessarily be the same as their position. So a number of different positions might satisfy the, a party's interests. And they've adopted one position, but it might be a question of uh, identifying a, a position between the two parties, which is actually coincides with each other, which serves both their interests. Yes, I think the I think there is I think sorry, Naomi. You, well, I was just going to say it depends so much on the type of dispute, doesn't it? I mean, it, it, if it's a simple financial dispute, or it's got a lot of issues and perhaps psychological issues as well, where you've got to work out what people really want from it. So it, it does it does depend, of course, on the on the kind of case that you're mediating. Yes, and I think the other thing is that in most cases you do go through uh, these phases and there is a, a very definite exploration phase before you get to the offers phase. But having said that, what you don't want is the exploration. I, I think one of the problems for that kind of five to five offer is that actually that's often where the exploration phase hasn't been gone through at all. And that there's this, you know, that there is just a very um, working out or expressions about entrenched views and so I think the so I can see where Jonathan where you're coming from the exploration phase has to be gone through before you get to the office phase but nevertheless when you do get to the office phase I think at that point you've got to uh, you know, you've got to get a grip really as a, a, as a mediator and strongly encourage the parties uh, and really to uh, set out a clear time frame. Um, uh, Grace Souter has uh, uh, has put in a question uh, as well, which I think is is very very apt. Why should we have uh, to engage in mediation as a means of compulsory ADR when you've got so many other options? Really, construction matters have statutory adjudication, which is a great job in reducing the number of matters uh, that continue to court, uh, as most accept the adjudicators award. Um, why not compulsory arbitration for business to business disputes? I'm open to uh, any views uh, in, in relation to that, and I think there, there is some there is some force in that. But uh, D Jonathan, do you have any uh, views about uh, the difficulties of compulsory yes. arbitration? Well, well, they're, they're fundamentally different, of course. Uh, adjudication and arbitration are are, are are fundamentally different from me mediation in, the, in in our in a mediation in our sense, a uh, private mediation. The mediator is a facilitator, um, and it's the parties that that effectively make the decision. The mediator doesn't doesn't get involved in deciding on the merits, whereas adjudication and arbitration quite clearly are, are matters where parties have agreed to, to, to um, submit themselves to, to effectively a decision by another party, which is great in the interest of business certainty and just resolving a dispute. Um, but arbitration and adjudication are sort of like justice light in a way. Uh, or they can be, or at least adjudication can be. Arbitration might be just as heavy because uh, arbitration can be more expensive than than, than the judicial process. Um, but of course, arbitration is private, so that that has uh, its advantages. Um, but but in a way, th those things are it, it not really qualitatively that different from um, the usual justice system, in that the parties submit themselves in in the case of arbitration voluntarily. Um, to a, uh, a an arbitrator who is going to decide uh, in a similar way that we submit ourselves compulsorily to a to a, uh, a state appointed judge, um, but but mediation is, is rather different from that because it's it, it has that flexibility and, and the parties are in control. Yes, I might rather cynically suggest that uh, one of the reasons why uh, perhaps they don't focus on. Uh, arbitration as a means of uh, resolving these disputes is because that's rather a confession that the court has failed to provide the service that it was set up to do because uh, that is essentially a privatised court system uh, and I, I agree there's a real contrast there. Naomi do you have anything you want to uh, add on that subject? Well only really that it, I, I, I don't see any reason why it does need to be mandatory mediation but any form of, of ADR or, or arbitration uh, according to what suits the case and as we've uh, sketched out a little bit this morning every case is different and each uh, each area of law will have its own uh, particularities which will lend themselves uh, better to, to different forms of, of ADR. It certainly seems to me that a cost and case management hearing would be an option uh, if you're discussing mediation at that point you could then also discuss the 
uh, alternative uh, alternative means uh, and certainly not necessarily uh, compel uh, mediation. If there was going to be an FDR, uh, it would seem unnecessary to uh, make provision for mediation. Uh, and uh, again, if you were going to opt for early neutral evaluation, for instance, under the uh, Chancery Division scheme, yeah, Chancery Division as was, I suppose, uh, then uh, then again, yeah, I, I can see that there wouldn't be, uh, that would be a very strong indicator against a direction uh, for uh, mediation. Uh, I think we've got time for just one last question. Um, there is an argument that forcing parties to participate in mediation ADR in places of further financial obstacle and impedes access to justice. Any thoughts on this? Well, I think I think that is a um, a real concern. Uh, I think the um, financial cost, though, it, to some extent, is likely to be moderated because if these schemes are imposed, then it's unlikely to be a scheme which imposes a private mediator. Uh, being uh, retained and more likely to be on a model uh, of uh, FDRs where you, you have a judge and say so there's not necessarily a payment or the uh, schemes offered by, for example, in my experience, the property chamber, which are free in terms of the services provided. And it's just a matter of the parties over who they have in attendance and the costs uh, involved in that. Um, but certainly financial obstacles and impediments to justice is two key factors. Um, Jonathan, do you have anything you'd like to add in relation to that? Well, I, 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 I think, personally, I think it is, it is a strong um, argument against mandatory mediation. Um, it, it does, it does, in my view, impose a, a, an obstacle. Um, when it's successful, um, and, and in some disputes, it's, it's very effective and very good. Uh, but, but yes, I think I would agree that, that fundamentally it does, it does impede access to justice. Naomi, yeah, I, I, I said that you might not be quite so, uh, quite so hostile. Yeah, I, I wouldn't agree with that. I think that um, the kind of uh, mediation, ENE, FDR, whatever it is, um, which is considered at the, uh, at the directions hearing, will always be proportionate. I mean, that, that's obviously an important element of anything that is, is directed. And I think that there are uh, proportionate ways of, of conducting mediation. I mean, I know Johnson, uh, you, you brought up uh, very helpfully uh, examples from other countries where, for example, in Italy, where lawyers are involved and it, it, it's a complex um, uh, scenario mediation. It, it doesn't need to be. It, it simply needs to be proportionate to the case. And almost invariably, even if it doesn't settle on the day, they very often settle later. The um, material which is used for the mediation is all material which is honing the issues. So that the mediation, even if not successful, may narrow the issues. Um, case summary is prepared, may be useful going forward. If it's conducted just before trial and it doesn't settle, well, then the, the preparation is, 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 is very, very similar because there'll, there'll have been conferences um, preparing the material. So I, I don't think that the, the, the cost burden need be um, overly, overly, if at all, onerous. Thank you. Well, I think we've, uh, we've come to the end, end of the questions. We've actually run on slightly longer than uh, uh, we uh, normally would for a seminar of this sort, but I think uh, I think that's been useful. I'm very grateful to uh, all the people who posted up questions um, for uh, encouraging us towards uh, a uh, good discussion. Uh, I'm very grateful also, uh, Naomi Jonathan, for your uh, for your useful insights on uh, on something which uh, we're going to have to watch because the courts are certainly uh, showing uh, some interest, and the highest judiciary is certainly showing some interest in. Uh, promoting uh, mediation even more than it's promoted now. So it's going to be very much a case of watch this space. And uh, thank you very much. And thank you for everybody who uh, attended uh, and uh, offered uh, questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Tony.